Hello, my name is Dr. Simon Freilich, I'm back again with the Clinical Neurophysiology channel and in this video I'm going to be talking about sleep quality. Every so often I get asked by uh, prospective patients, um, I have poor quality sleep, um, please can you arrange for me to have um, some sleep testing? And that's not really what my thing is with sleep, obviously I see a lot of brain activity during sleep in my work with epilepsy, things that go bump in the night, um, but in order to try and address this, I really want to start thinking about, you know, what can be tested, what's the right test for, for people who have this poor quality sleep to have. So, first of all, what, what exactly do we mean by this? Good quality sleep, I'm just going to take it as a given, is important for our health and our functionality during the day. But what do we mean by quality? Um, is it something to do with our previous night's sleep, which can be something which is very difficult to describe because we often cannot perceive the depth of our sleep. We can certainly perceive if we've been woken up numerous times. We can certainly perceive if we feel tired uh, when we wake up. Uh, and we can certainly perceive whether we feel drowsy during um, in activities of, of, of life during the day ahead. Um, but it's very difficult for us to describe our actual night's sleep. We could be also be talking about our functionality for during the daytime. And so if we don't sleep well, or usually our function during the day is not particularly good. So are we talking more about a poor night's sleep or are we talking more about um, poor function during the daytime? And it's actually very difficult and becomes much more broader when you start thinking about our functionality, our refreshment during the daytime, because we don't just live in a little Petri dish. It's not just about our biology. In the day ahead, we also have our psychological state um, and we also have our social interactions as well, our work, our family, people around us and so on. And so our state of, of feeling as we go through the day ahead is actually quite a complex thing and it's not just about sleep and lack of it alone. So are there any criteria? Are there perhaps some positive criteria in terms of positive things that we can experience about our sleep or negative things is it lack of sleep uh, and so on and what is subjective and what is objective things that we feel ourselves or things that we can actually have measured so in order to answer this the, the first group of things we can actually use are sleep questionnaires and we can of course just use open-ended questions uh, with our patients but that doesn't really help anyone and it's very difficult to have consistency uh, between uh, interviews with patients between studies. So by having a sleep questionnaire, these are really uh, well validated specific uh, tools which can get very reproducible answers uh, between different clinic visits. And so there's a whole range of them. Uh, perhaps some of the most commonly used ones are the Epworth Sleepiness Score or the Pittsburgh um, Sleep Quality Index. There's a whole range of others too, but, but those are some of the most common ones that get used. And just to go through briefly what the Epworth Sleep in a Scale is about, it's giving a score for the chance of dozing during relatively common daily activities. So, for example, someone sitting and reading, what's the chance of dozing off? Someone watching TV, what's the chance of dozing off? Uh, or sitting inactive, and, and, and so on. And you can actually analyse your own score and see just how drowsy you are or basically through the the day ahead the pittsburgh um, sleep quality index is a little bit more in depth it's not just assessing your level of drowsiness but the first section of it is actually trying to quantify how much sleep you're getting um, the sort of middle section um, of this um, actually looks at things that may cause you trouble with your sleeping um, and um, a little bit about um, how you function during the day and then the last bit is if you have a, a, a bed partner or a roommate who can sort of give some further information about how you sleep and uh, as with any tool um, whether it's the Epworth sleepiness scale or the Pittsburgh sleep quality index or even polysonography they all serve their own particular purpose and they don't necessarily all 100% correlate with each other 
Now, in terms of objective uh, means and measures, we've got a whole range of different types of technologies, which I've mostly covered um, already in previous videos, uh, link above. Um, actigraphy, where you've got a motion detector on your wrist. Um, polysonography, where we're measuring brain waves and correlating those with other um, measures of oxygen saturations and chest movements and so on, limb movements. We've got multiple sleep latency testing. We're looking at how quickly people uh, fall asleep. And of course, there's a whole subject of smart uh, wearable technology as well, which is an evolving uh, field. And using all of those uh, different types of measures, you can look at different things that may include uh, the sleep time, sleep efficiency, how long it takes to fall asleep, limb movements, position, and all of those sorts of things. And the more complex and more sensitive the technology that you use, you can pick up different um, aspects too, arousals, micro arousals, types of arousals, oxygenation, breathing, etc. Here are a couple of examples with the idealized hypnogram. This is a representation of the stages of sleep, which we've talked about previously, um, for the average person. So we go from being awake at the beginning of the night down into slow wave synchronized sleep, then come up into a little bit of REM, and then come back down again into slow wave sleep, back into REM, slow wave sleep, and the proportion of slow wave sleep steadily decreasing, and the amount of REM and lighter stages of sleep steadily increasing as the night goes on until we wake up in the morning. And this is what the hypnogram of an actual person with a one night uh, sleep study will look like. Um, it goes down as just as, as with this in a game of two halves. The first part of the night is really dedicated to slow wave sleep. As we continue, we have increasing amounts of REM sleep here highlighted in the bright blue. Um, and just to note that back in the day when I was doing this, we had stage three and four, uh, which have been amalgamated just into stage three. So um, this is all slow wave sleep over here and then coming up into these lighter stages through the night. Now, not everyone has this. Um, and here's an example of someone who's got a bladder um, hyper um, mobility disorder. And um, you can see that they are basically uh, going down into slow wave sleep with plenty of um, arousals, plenty of awakening over here, and they're spending an awful lot of the uh, night being awake actually, or in the lighter stages of sleep. And they do descend occasionally down into slow wave sleep, but a lot of that is fragmented. Um, but um, you know, there are all sorts of reasons that people get disturbed during their sleep and have poor quality sleep. And this is just one of many potential causes. This is another type um, of sleep disturbance called periodic le leg movements uh, disorder where people are vigorously moving their legs. It's actually, this is the uh, count of the leg uh, movements over here. And you can see that basically they're not able to enter into the slow wave sleep until uh, much later on into the evening and for, only for a, a short period of time. Most of the time in stage one, stage two sleep um, because they've been constantly awoken by their legs moving and that's causing them to wake up. This is another variation. This is called REM sleep behavior disorder. We've talked about previously when people um, are in the REM sleep uh, state, um, effectively apart from the eye motion and the diaphragm moving up and down, um, all the other skeletal muscles are effectively paralyzed in order to prevent injury to ourselves so we shouldn't act out our dreams and over here where you see these blue bars where REM is occurring uh, there is a lot of movement um, of, of their limbs and that's reflective of their REM behavior sleep disorder they also happen to have very poor sleep quality at the beginning of the evening too but but this is the the point which is uh, most important here uh, which is that REM behavior disorder now, the question is, is what really matters to us? I mean, we can do polysonography, we can do activity, we can do all these different wonderful things. But what actually is the thing that really matters to our sleep quality? And it turns out there are two main things. The first one is feeling refreshed when we wake up in the morning. And the second one is sleep continuity. We are aware when we are being constantly woken up and we want to have non-fragmented periods of sleep where our sleep is continuous and we wake up in the morning feeling refreshed. So those are the two main measures which, when you survey uh, people, are the things that really count. So 
what's the right sleep test uh, to assess sleep quality? So it's very difficult to be categorical and it really does depend on your personal situation. Um, Non-restorative sleep is a very common problem. It affects about a third of the population. Uh, the majority of sleep issues actually relate to psychological, social and environmental issues. And it's best to try and address these directly and follow the sleep hygiene uh, principles and guidance, which I've talked about previously and you know, link up um, above uh, to some of that information. In terms of our sensation of feeling refreshed, um, that is best validated um, being done by questionnaire. There are some semi-objective measures like uh, measuring irritability to sound and so on, um, but the best measures and the most validated ones are done via these questionnaires um, and the specific one required will vary depending on what the issues are. Um, sleep fragmentation is something that we can measure um, using laboratory techniques, whether that's actigraphy, which is obviously quite you know, less obtrusive, it's just something on the wrist, um, and you can get quite a long capture of data up to a couple of weeks even, although as we've talked about previously, it's less accurate than polysonography. Polysonography, certainly much more accurate, um, and that's really something which has got its place for those with medical conditions, particularly obstructive sleep apnea. So um, thank you for watching, happy to take any questions down below, and um, please do support the channel by liking, sharing, and above all subscribing. Many thanks and hope to see you in the next video soon. All the very best.